Here we're here with Paul Barrett, the author of Glock, The Rise of America's Gun. Uh, we're here at SHOT Show 2013. And uh, I wanted to first off say it's a pleasure to meet you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. And uh, can I ask, why, why, did you, why did you write the book? Well, I've written about the gun industry for many years, going back to the mid-1990s. And I had always been fascinated by Glock in particular, because in my opinion, the history of Glock really captures the history of the larger industry, certainly on the handgun side, uh, from the 80s to the present. I mean, if you walk around at the SHOT Show today here and didn't look closely, you might think that all of the handguns were made by Glock. They all look so similar to what the Glock uh, introduced all the way back in uh, the early 1980s. So when I had the opportunity to get some very interesting inside information about the company from some uh, former senior executives, I decided, all right, here's my mechanism for writing about the gun industry. The history of this company will be a proxy for the history of the exactly. industry overall. That's a great way to say it. Yeah. And that's what I really enjoyed about it. It kind of relates everything from Saturday Night Specials to assault rifles to politics Absolutely. to culture. Well, the Glock has been... You know, central to all of the major debates about guns in American society since it first appeared on these shores in the 1980s, beginning with the, uh, the felt need on the part of law enforcement for a larger capacity weapon, to the debate over so-called plastic pistols, which brought a tremendous amount of attention in the late 1980s, to the debate in the early 1990s about large capacity magazines. The litigation against the gun industry, Glock was central to that in the late uh, 1990s. In connection with these horrendous mass shootings, when these bad guys bring a handgun to these mass shootings, it tends to be a Glock, not by coincidence, but because of its extraordinary capacity. So whenever you look at handguns in this country, there's Glock having redefined the debate. It seems to me like we're reliving the same history over and over, and it, you definitely touch on it in the book, but Absolutely. we get these uh, media frenzies uh, and then react to, uh, reactive uh, legislation. Well, we're, we're, I think, reliving history or a, a Groundhog Day writ large is definitely what's going on right now. We are about to debate some of the exact same legislative proposals that were debated, in some cases enacted, in the early 1990s. And um, we are already seeing the counterintuitive impact of that debate. In the early 1990s, the effort to uh, ban so-called assault weapons, of course, contributed to the greater proliferation of assault weapons, in some cases because they were sold pre-banned, in other cases because industry uh, tinkered with certain cosmetics and just sold the same basic right. firearm. We're, we're seeing that right now. I mean, it, just in the past month, uh, retail stores have sold out of AR-15s. They've sold out of the uh, precise kind of uh, ammunition that was used in the Newtown shooting. So we've got this strange phenomenon in this country where people who want to restrict certain weapons actually, uh, not meaning to, but unwittingly actually contribute to selling more of those weapons. Exactly. It's a strange, it's a strange process. And they don't, it seems like they don't understand because they keep doing the same thing and it happens again. It is a... Unfortunately, it seems happening on our side too. We seem to uh, allow us to have to go through this nation, nationwide debate over and over without... Well, I, I do think there are, there would be ways to, uh, to find in some areas of consensus, uh, particularly on gun-related law enforcement, not so much the regulation of particular categories of weapons, but instead the uh, more vigorous enforcement of very basic criminal laws that we already have. That exist, exactly. And um, unfortunately, I, I fear that uh, advocates on both sides prefer to fight than to actually exactly. fight. And that, I think, you know, unfortunately, I fear that's, I feel, that's true on the pro-gun side just like it is on the anti-gun side. If, I feel like they, they both profit when they just um, continually debate. There's no doubt about that. The NRA is a fundraising machine and it doesn't they are they don't raise money based on calm and tranquility. They raise money on turmoil. Excellent. Well again I appreciate it. If, if I just want to from the author, I'm not getting paid when I tell people to read this book, correct? <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay that's right. not coerced. <laughs> no 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 I wish I was but it was it's an excellent book and I really do appreciate it again. Thank you. My great pleasure. Let me, uh, let me What's the next project? Or is my next project? Yeah. <laughs> Can we talk about it? <laughs> yeah, well, my next, uh, my very next uh, magazine piece, because I work for Business Magazine, that's my day job, 
is I'm going to be writing a cover story uh, in coming, probably come out in a month or two about uh, the NRA and our, our whole current debate uh, in the wake of the Newtown shooting and President Obama's announcement that he's now going to push for gun control. And I'm going to look at the dynamics of that debate and the sources of the, uh, the NRA's influence and try to figure out how that debate is going to unfold. My next book is on a completely different subject. It has to do with uh, oil pollution in the uh, Amazon and eastern Ecuador. Equally important, but uh, definitely a different topic. Different topic. The guys and gals of GunWebsites.com encourage you to take a CCW class every year, practice at least once a month, and carry every day. Thanks for watching GunWebsites.com.